Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I know it's been about a week since the last episode, but I'm still getting used to doing this on my own and dealing with my chronic illnesses at the same time. But I promise that we'll get on a regular schedule again soon, as I have some fun things in the works that I swear you all enjoy. So here's another mini-sode to get your history juices flowing for the week. I'm going to start us off quickly with the fair dues warning that, that this episode desperately needs, as I know that this can be a very emotional topic, but it's one that I want to cover with everything kind of happening in the world. So here it is. Fair dues warning that today's topic is about an abortionist. So there is talk about infant deaths as well as maternal deaths. Some of the terminology used can be graphic and could be triggering, so please be warned. While some parts of the topic may feel insensitive, please remember that this story takes place during the 1800s, when women's topics were treated as so. I completely understand if you need to pause, take breaks, or turn off this episode entirely, but if you're still with us, let's dive into the life of Madame Ristel. We're traveling back to New York City in 1831, when Anne Summers moved from England to the big city with her husband and her newborn daughter, Caroline. A few months after the move, her husband caught a fever and passed away, leaving Anne as a widow with an infant on the other side of the world from any family. She did what she could to survive until she married a second time to Charles Lohman, a Russian immigrant who printed a local newspaper. The new family moved on to Chatham Street, where Anne met her new neighbor, Dr. William Evans. Dr. Evans had zero medical training, but he made his money by selling fake medicines that would treat everything under the sun. Anne saw how lucrative the business was and decided that she could do exactly that herself to provide to her family. In order to understand Anne's story, though, we need to understand the world of women at the time. Women's rights were very different from today. There were few opportunities for women to be educated or trained in medicine or matters of the human body in general. We tend to believe that women were heavily excluded from making decisions about their bodies, but that isn't fully true. If a woman found herself just before the quote-unquote quickening, she could easily find medicines that would remove the fetus before she could feel it moving. If the medicines didn't work, a doctor of sorts could surgically remove the baby. It wasn't really thought of as anything because family planning was considered a private matter for women to make decisions about. Around 1827, a law was passed that made abortions illegal in New York. Remember, this is the USA that I'm talking about. Abortion laws were in place around the world since around the end of the 16th century. This is when Sir Edward Coke formulated what was known as the born alive rule, which meant that once a woman could feel the baby moving, aka the quickening, then the baby was considered alive and abortions would be considered homicide. The 1827 law used this idea of the born alive rule in determining the level of punishment depending on the time of pregnancy. A post-quickening abortion would be considered a felony, while a pre-quickening abortion was considered like, to be a misdemeanor. Illinois and Connecticut were creating laws at the same time, which made abortion medications be classified as poisons, so that any time frame of abortion could be punished with criminal penalties. However, the only way for authorities to know if someone was quote-unquote committing an act of abortion themselves, either as the mother or the practitioner, was if someone reported it. Many women of the time were in solidarity when it came to the rights of their bodies, and so reports were very infrequent. Now, I'm not here to get into the discussion about if abortion is the right thing to do or not, but for transparency, I do understand why a woman may decide to have an abortion, and I do believe in the woman's right to choose what happens to their body. On topics like this, I believe context is everything. But today's context is the history of one specific historical abortionist, so let's get back to, to her story. Where we left her off, Anne was just starting her business of selling what she considered to be medicine. There is a chance that what she was creating did work, as she may have consulted some herbal medicine books or other women who used herbology in a way that practiced medicine. We talked a little bit about this in our Tragic Movies and Theater Myths episode a while back, so I won't get too deep into it here. As Anne's name started to get out there that she was selling these medicines, a client came to her looking for a way to remove an unwanted pregnancy. In the 1800s, saw many advertisements with hidden messages to women, so it was only a matter of time that someone might go to another female for such products. 
these adverts would use terms such as uterine tonics or female washes to advertise early forms of birth control, while terms like female regulators and rose injections would mean abortion methods. When Anne met her first abortion client, it was evident that this was going to become her bread and butter. Anne wasn't trained in medicine, so when she got the new request, she most likely found an old recipe that was known to do as requested. The ingredients used were usually pennyroyal, savin, black drought, tansy tea, oil of cedar, ergot of rye, mallow, and motherwort. With her medicine business slowly taking off, Anne decided to quit her seamstress job to go full-time. Her husband Charles soon followed her into the field with no training of his own. In the fall of 1838, they went back to England with their daughter to visit family and came up with a business plan that would take New York by storm. Anne decided to take the chance to rebrand herself as Madame Restelle and told everyone how she visited Paris and learned the newest, safest ways of helping the women of New York and beyond. On March 18, 1839, an advert came out in the newest edition of the New York Sun, telling everyone about Madame Restelle's services. If you didn't read the New York Sun, you'd find out about her services soon enough, when her mail-order business went countrywide through flyers. Offices were soon established in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. Her business ideas were savage yet brilliant. First, women could purchase her version of birth control, which wasn't made to work very well. When they found themselves pregnant anyways, they could then purchase the more expensive abortion medication. If that didn't work for the unlucky women, they could visit one of the offices to receive a medical abortion that would make it look like a miscarriage. Those services cost the upper-class women $100, or if it was $20 if you were more poor. These offices were open from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily, and there was almost always a queue out the door. Anne's problem, though, was this. It was deemed too dangerous to society for women to have this kind of control over their bodies. We know from history that sex was considered necessary by the church, only if women were being produced. This meant that the religious leaders were unhappy. Then you have the men who want to keep jobs. There were two sides to this argument that made sense to them. One was that Anne was a woman, with very little to no training in the field, yet she was making more money and getting more employment than the medically trained men. Secondly, if the American families were not having as many children as they usually did, there would be vacant spaces in the workforce for immigrants to take over. As we know, America doesn't have the greatest track record of being open to immigrant populations, so there's no surprise that this would be a major reason for them to want the quote-unquote good, clean American families procreating. Anne found out firsthand about five months after her advert started to be published the lengths that people would be willing to go in order to shut her down. She was arrested for the first time of many, but ultimately let go as the charges were dropped. This was likely a warning arrest in hopes that she'd be too nervous about a second arrest and just shut down the business. But she was resilient and continued on, even as men started to dub her the wickedest woman in New York. That title now belongs to Elphaba. If you're a Broadway nerd, you'll get the joke. The newspapers also started to report that the services Anne provided actually were hurting the women and killing many of them. The false news spurred some riots outside the offices by women who were concerned for safety as well as the men who hated her in 1846. None of that stopped those who were in need of Anne's services, however, and they just adapted to visiting around the riot times as well as around the police patrols slash raids. Now, Anne was still a family woman as her daughter grew up and married in 1854 with the mayor as the officiant. She knew how to keep her high-status reputation, as she continually made a fortune off of her services. In 1847, she did get arrested for a second time and was charged for conducting an illegal surgical abortion. Once her year in prison was up, she paid the small monetary fine of the time, she went back to business, and just ended up selling her pills only. It was much harder to prove the medication caused an abortion than a surgical mean. Her wealth continued to grow after a slight drop in the onset of removing the surgical option, and she finally built a mansion alongside her husband in the wealthier area of New York City. Much to her neighbor's horror, she opened a small clinic in her home to continue her services. In 1873, a new foe entered Anne's world by the name of Anthony Comstock. 
Anthony was driven to stop abortions in the state and desperately wanted Anne to serve her time. He created a federal law that made it illegal to sell obscene material through the mail, abortion pills included. Anne received a mail-in request for some pills and sent them off, directly to Anthony, who was undercover. She was arrested once again, and no one came forward in support. Her husband had passed the year before, and she wasn't going to go down as a federal criminal. Just one day before her trial, on April 1, 1878, Anne Trow Lohman committed suicide by slitting her throat in her bathtub at home. Comstock was sure that it was an April Fool's joke, but when he got his proof that Anne was definitely dead, he wrote his last comment about her on her file. A bloody ending to a bloody life. This is just an overview of Anne's life, and so I do implore listeners to check out my resources on her, especially the newly published book by Jennifer Wright called Madame Rostel, The Life, Death, and Resurrection of Old New York's Most Fabulous, Fearless, and Infamous Abortionist. It is really worth the read to get deep inside what it was like in the 1800s for a woman, especially one who was selling abortion cures or needed the abortions themselves. Thank you all for listening to this mini-sode, and I'll catch you guys next week.